Uh, keep your Bibles open there to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Uh, it's a bit of a controversial uh, chapter this time around. Uh, some quite challenging uh, phrases that were spoken of Jesus Christ. But look at verse number 8, please. Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. The Bible says, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. The title for the sermon tonight is The Hardness of Your Hearts. The Hardness of Your Hearts. Let's pick it up from verse number 1, Matthew chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. So if you know your geography, uh, Galilee is north um, from Jerusalem and, and uh, Judea means he would have had to travel south, okay? So the reason why he's traveling to Judea now, this is toward the end of his ministry. We've been going through his ministry for the last 18 chapters. Now we're getting toward the end of his ministry. Now he's going on his way to Jerusalem for his final stop, right? He gets to Jerusalem. That's where he's going to be betrayed. That's where he's going to be crucified. That's where he's going to pay for our sins. So he's now on his way, the last journey, and it says here at the end of verse number one that he came to the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Now, just so you guys know, um, we've got access to that document documentary called Beyond Jordan now, okay, because our church donated to that uh, project. I've started sharing the, the link. We don't have a DVD just yet, but I've been sharing the link to some of you guys. So w- once you've watched it, we'll share it to some other families in the church. Uh, but it's a documentary called Beyond Jordan, which basically goes through some of the areas. Uh, so it kind of gives you a geographic understanding of the Bible. So it's a pretty effective documentary. That's what, not what I'm going to pre- be preaching about. I just found it interesting that we've got that phrase there, Beyond Jordan, at the end of verse number one. That's where it comes from. But then look at verse number two. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So once again, we see Jesus on his journey. Once again, he's preaching and he has great multitudes following him. Jesus Christ had many disciples. Every time he went traveling from town to town, you guys have already seen he's had great multitudes around him. Okay? Just as a reminder, because at the end, when he gets arrested, when he gets crucified, on the day of Pentecost, There was only 120 people that were gathered in in the upper room, if you guys remember. He had thousands of people following him, okay? And this is a reality of Christianity. There are thousands of Christians, okay? There are a lot of believers out there, but very few actually make it to church. And out of those that actually go to church, very few of those actually go out door-to-door soul winning. This is just a reality of Christianity. We see this in the time of Christ, great multitudes believing on him, following him, but really when it came to doing the great works, it was always just a handful of believers. We'll keep reading. Verse number three. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, tempting Jesus that is, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, what a question. Now, the Pharisees come to Jesus. So for every reason, for every cause, can we put away our wives? Can we divorce our wives basically for any reason. Now, as you read this in your Bible, you're probably thinking, well, that's a stupid question. For every reason? Or essentially, if you can put away your wife, if you can get divorced for every cause, every reason, then really what that means is you can get divorced for no reason. It doesn't matter. If it's every reason you get get divorced, then it doesn't really matter. It can be for no reason. And it might sound like a stupid question, but you know what? We have this system in our nation today. Okay, I looked this up. In 1975, our government brought in the no, uh, what's, it, what's it called? The, uh, uh, I wrote it down, the uh, uh, No Fault Divorce uh, Act. No Fault Divorce. So prior to 1975, if you wanted to get divorced, you had to prove that your spouse had committed adultery or was a habitual drinker, he was a drunkard, or he was insane. Okay, if you, if you could prove those reasons to the law, then you could legally get divorced in our nation. Okay, now I'm not saying those are the laws of, of the Bible, I'm just saying in our nation. Okay, even in our nation, okay, we had restrictions. Okay, but from 1975, so before I was born, they removed that and said, Well, we'll just do no fault divorce. You don't have to prove anything as long as you're separated for 12 months, you're not living together, that's fine, we'll grant you your divorce. Okay, and so in Australia, can we divorce for every cause? Absolutely. 
For no cause? Absolutely. Okay? And of course, when you start changing the fabric of what marriage is meant to represent, this is why we have failing marriages. This is why our divorce rates going through the roof. This is why people don't take marriage seriously. Okay? So, you know, what I, as a pastor, I get a lot of these questions. Okay? Because my generation and even the prior generations, our generations have made a lot of mistakes. Okay, because we've removed these laws, because the preachers behind the pulpit have gotten weaker. Okay, preachers today don't preach against divorce. All right, before, yeah, absolutely, every church in Australia preached on divorce. You know, the Protestants preached on divorce, the Roman Catholics preached on divorce, the Orthodox preached on divorce. We, 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 we are now in a nation where people don't want to talk about this because it's going to hurt people's feelings. Well, look, it, it doesn't matter whose feelings we're, we're, we're hurting. At the end of the day, we're all sinners. And if we're going to preach the Bible, we're always going to trample on somebody's sins. We're always going to trample on someone's mistakes. But the thing I want you to remember is this. If you've made a mistake, okay, you're already in a situation where you've been divorced or you've been remarried, these kinds of things, and you say, well, I can't change that now. Well, look, appreciate the preaching and teach your kids the right way. Teach your kids because your kids have not made mistakes yet. You know, your kids don't have to go through the same struggles, the same stress that you may have gone through when you've gone through this situation in your life, okay? This is why it's important to preach this. You know, I'm afraid to hurt people. Not really. What I really want is for the next generation to be better than us. I want them to hear preaching from the Word of God and know what God has to say about divorce and remarriage. Now, I get these questions a lot, okay? I do. I get, because there's a lot of people that have made mistakes, okay? I'm in this situation now, so what do I do? And everybody has their own situations, okay? Because divorce is very messy, okay? Marriage is super easy. It's super clean. One man, one woman, married for life, children in that family home. Simple, easy, clean, makes sense. Divorce is always very messy. And it becomes very messy, of course, when there's children involved in that, okay? And so the question often comes, what do I do in my situation? What do I do in that situation? Well, the best response to that is to see how Jesus responded, okay? Now, the Bible is not written for everybody's situation, okay? The Bible's not written that way. The Bible is written to show us God's standard, okay? The Bible is written to show us His perfect will, Okay? And when you're outside of that perfect will, or you can't fix things because you've made mistakes in the past, the best thing for you to do is say, well, this is the situation I'm in. This is God's perfect will. How best can I make my situation line up with God's perfect will? But here's the thing. When it comes to marriage and divorce, you'll never get it exactly how God intended it. Okay? You're going to have to go with plan B in your life. And you know what? Plan B in your life may be even better than the plan A for a lot of people. You know, if plan B, you've made mistakes, say, well, you know what, Lord, I've made mistakes, but I want to serve you. I want to be in church. I want to get right with you. I've made mistakes. I can't change the past, Lord, but I want to follow after you today. Hey, your plan B can be effective. Your plan B can please the Lord. Many of us have plan A's, and we don't even serve the Lord of our plan A's. Okay, so there's never a place where there's no hope for people that have made, made mistakes. There's always hope. I mean, the Bible is filled of people making mistakes. Okay, always making mistakes, reminding us how long suffering our God is, how merciful our God is. All right, but how did Jesus answer? Did Jesus answer every cause? Or every cause. So does he start giving a reason? Okay, in this cause, you do this. For this cause of marriage, divorce, you do this. For this cause, no. He focuses on the single cause of marriage. Jesus Christ goes back to what marriage represents. Look at verse number four. Verse number four. So their question was, every cause, Jesus, give us an answer for every cause. Jesus says, look, I'll give you an answer for one cause. Look at this, verse number four. And he answered and said unto them, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. What's Jesus Christ quoting here? Genesis chapter 1. All right? So he's insulting them. He says, have you not read Genesis chapter 1? I mean, I think everyone in this church, even if you say to me, I've never read my Bible cover to cover, I'm sure you've read Genesis chapter 1. All right? So he's insulting them. Right? Have you not read Genesis chapter 1, where it says God created them male and female in the beginning? 
And it's interesting, I mean, I shouldn't have to labor these points. It should be obvious, but Jesus Christ is telling us here that marriage is between one man and one woman. Amen. I mean, in 2019, I actually have to say this behind the pulpit now, okay? Because our society has gotten so, uh, you know, anti-God, has got so anti-biblical. Today in our nation, men can marry men and women can ma marry women. Have they not read Genesis chapter 1, because if they read Genesis chapter 1, if the churches were preaching from Genesis chapter 1, we wouldn't be in the mess we are today in our nation. Okay, I'm not going to back away from this. Marriage is between one man and one woman, and the whole thing, what they call marriage between men and men, that's not marriage. Okay, that's an abomination. Okay, it's an abomination. It's not marriage. All right, let's keep reading verse number 5. And said, for this cause, now remember, that was saying for every cause divorce, he says, look, for this cause, this is, this is marriage, all right? For this cause, shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. So Jesus is saying, look, when there's a man and woman, when they get married, they become one flesh. I was going through this with my church up in Queensland. The Bible tells us in Genesis uh, 5 that uh, God called their name Adam, okay? He, you know, yes, we, we, we think of Adam and Eve, but God called their name Adam, it's the same idea when I married my wife, she took on my name, okay? Christina Rodriguez became Christina Sepulveda. She took on my name. We became Mr. and Mrs. Kevin Sepulveda. We became one family unit, one flesh. When it says there, and shall cleave to his wife, it's speaking about being glued together, okay? Being joined together. That's why, you know, in, in, in our day and age, we say, well, people say, you know, when are you going to tie the knot? They're talking about when are you going to get married? You know, when are you going to join together? When are you going to cleave together? That's what it means by tying the knot. We still use that idea today because you become one unit, you become one flesh. And then the Bible says here in verse number six, wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. Pay attention to that, guys. If you're married, you're not uh, twain. You're not two people as far as God is concerned. He says you're one flesh. He looks at you as one team, one unit. What therefore God have joined together let not man put asunder. So Jesus says, look, marriage is for life. Let not man put asunder. There's no reason that you should get divorced. That is not God's perfect will in your life to get divorced. Okay? We should be thinking of marriage as a lifelong commitment till death do us part. All right? Verse number seven. They say unto him, because now they're asking the question, right? They're tempting him, remember. It's not like they want an honest answer. They're coming here to Jesus to find fault. And let me tell you this, when I started my church in Queensland, I started to get random phone calls, just weirdos, and I thought this was normal. I thought maybe, maybe all the pastors get all these weirdos calling them. They were calling me, what do you believe about divorce? What do you believe about alcohol? What do you believe about whatever? Just all these things. At first I thought they wanted honest answers, but then I started to realize these people are trying to find fault in my answers. All right. It's the same thing they're doing to Jesus. They're trying to find faults to his answer here. Verse number seven, they said unto him, why did Moses then command to give them, give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So what they're saying is true. Okay. In the Bible, Moses did speak about a bill of divorcement. There is biblical divorce. Okay. There is something, you know, like people commonly think about independent Baptists, that you're against divorce. Well, by and large, we are, because when you think about divorce as far as the world standard is, yeah, we're against the way the world uh, does divorce, okay? But there is biblical divorce, and we're going to have a look at that soon. And then it says here, verse number eight. So why, why did Moses write this? Verse number eight. <coughs> he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered or allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So he says, look, this was not God's intention. But because of the hardness of your hearts, this isn't what God really wants in a marriage. But because you've been hardened, men, husbands been hardened against their wives, wives' hearts have been hardened against their husbands, God did permit divorce, okay, in the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to look at that later on. But remember, we're talking about biblical divorce, okay? And biblical divorce is not for every cause. Biblical divorce has parameters. And we're going to look at that shortly, all right? Verse number nine. Verse number nine, and I say unto you, now pay attention to this, this is so important. I think this is black and white. I, I really think this is black and white. I don't think there's any loopholes around this. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife 
except to be for fornication, and shall marry another committed for adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. All right. So Jesus says, look, if you get divorced for any reason besides fornication, or if you get married to someone that has been divorced, he says you're committing adultery. All right. So we see the parameter that Jesus gives. The only permissible reason to get divorced is because of fornication. All right. Now, there's, now there's going to be two thoughts about this because that's black and white. Okay. Nobody can really debate about what Jesus says. But the question becomes, for people that want to try to find a way around this, is, well, what does fornication mean? Because if we can make fornication to mean several things, then we can get divorced for several reasons. That's essentially what it means, okay? So let's look at the two common options that people talk about when it comes to uh, uh, divorce here. Now, the first thing I'm going to get you to do is please turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. Keep your finger there in Matthew 19. Keep your finger in Matthew 19. And go to Jeremiah chapter 3, okay? Because the first argument is, well, fornication can mean all types of sexual sins. All kinds of sexual acts can fall under the umbrella of fornication. Now, I'll just say this. I think sometimes, yes, biblically speaking, fornication can be an umbrella term. For other sins, I believe that, okay, but I don't believe it's an umbrella term in this chapter, okay, and I'm going to explain to you why. But let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, and we're going to see how some people uh, try to find a loophole in this, all right? Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, God speaks here, and he says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away. And given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So let's think about this. This is God speaking about the northern tribe of Israel, right? He says about them that they've committed adultery, okay? And because they've committed adultery, God has put them away and given them a bill of divorcement, okay? So the argument there is, well, see, God here... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, names adultery here in this passage as grounds for divorce. So Israel has, divor- uh, has committed adultery. God is divorced in Israel over it. And therefore God is given Israel a, a bill of divorcement. And so by that passage, the conclusion then becomes, well, if God can divorce over adultery, then surely when Jesus Christ speaks of fornication here in Matthew 19, that must also include adultery. So if your husband or your wife cheats on you, okay, they commit adultery, that is grounds for divorce. So I'm I'm showing you what one interpretation is. I don't agree with that interpretation, and I'll go through that in a moment, okay? But I'm just showing you the scriptures behind that so you become aware when people bring up these arguments to you. Now, why don't I accept this? Because was God married to Israel? I mean, when we look at the passage that we're looking at here, okay, one man, one woman, till death do us part, did God actually get married to Israel? Or, like, is he literally married to Israel? Or is this figurative language? Is God using the allegory of a marriage and divorce to speak about his relationship with Israel and himself? What do you think? Do you think this is a literal marriage or an allegory? Figurative speaking. Obviously, obviously, it's figurative speaking, right? Obviously, when, when, when God says that Israel committed adultery, he's speaking there of spiritual adultery. He's speaking about the nation going and serving other gods. The nations of, uh, you know, turn their hearts against the Lord, right? And he, and he uses this extreme case of, of this picture that he's given them. Now, look, do you think there was a bill of divorcement? Do you think there's paperwork somewhere that God wrote? I'm divorcing you, Israel. No, this is not a literal divorce, okay? This is obviously figurative language, okay? So taking this story and applying it between husband and wife, one man and one woman, you know, you're drawing a really long bow there. I mean, you're trying to apply something that doesn't really apply. Now, let me give you another, let me give you this other idea here. So the the idea here is, well, see, God divorced because of adultery, therefore we can divorce because of adultery. 
Now let me give you another allegory or another figurative language here and go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're looking basically at a passage of the rapture here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2. Now this is obviously a passage a lot of you are aware of. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2. It says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Okay? So think about this. The Lord is coming as what? A thief in the night. Okay, a thief in the night. Do you think Jesus is literally a thief? If he was, he'd be breaking the commandments of God. All right? But let me, let me give you this argument. So let's take this picture. All right? So God divorced Israel because of adultery. Therefore, I can divorce because of adultery. Well, that's like saying, I can be a thief. I can go and, I can go and rob the bank because Jesus is coming as a thief. I mean, you say, say how ridiculous when you take something that is meant to be figurative, something that's meant to be like an allegory of, of, some, of, of some greater truth, and then you're applying that to a literal, uh, um, uh, you know, um, or, or a physical, literal interpretation, you're going to start messing things up. I mean, if you've read the Bible, you start to realize there are certain things that are literal, there are certain things that are figurative. Okay, when the Bible says that, you know, if you, you go out and, and you proclaim the, the uh, you know, uh, the Lord, the, uh, sorry, the words of the Lord, the Bible says that the, um, the, uh, the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the hills shall clap their hands. I mean, do you think the trees are literally clapping their hands? Do you think the hills and the mountains are literally opening their mouths and singing? No, of course not, right? They don't have hands, they don't have mouths, but this is figurative language to tell us that creation rejoices when the, when the, uh, the word of the God is, is proclaimed throughout the world. Okay, we understand there is figurative language, and then there are literal things that we need to base our doctrines on. All right? So, no, I do not believe adultery is grounds for divorce. Okay, I don't believe you can take something that's figurative between God and a nation. Okay, with no real literal bill of divorcement, okay, this is obviously figure language, and then apply that between one man and one woman. Okay, I think you're taking it way too far. All right, so let's talk about what I believe this is talking about. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, please. Deuteronomy chapter 24, because the important thing here is that we keep it within context. Always, guys, when you're struggling with something, stay within the context of the chapter or, or refer back to an Old Testament passage which the New Testament is speaking of or stay within the same book that you're reading from. Quite often, the answers are in the same book. Okay, But look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, because this is where Moses taught on the bill of divorcement. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Look at this. It says, When a man have taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he have found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Here we have a, the, the biblical practice of divorce. Okay, now, I'll go into that in a, in a little bit more moment. But what I want you to notice is when this woman is biblically divorced from her husband, is she allowed to be remarried? She is allowed to be remarried, right? But when Jesus Christ is dealing with the Pharisees' unbiblical divorce, he says you cannot marry a divorced woman. Okay, so we're talking about, you know, Jesus is addressing their issues for every cause. There is a cause, okay, to get divorced, and it's, it's found within here in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. So I just want you to see that, okay, when the husband finds some uncleanness in his wife. Now, go to Matthew chapter 1, please. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We'll just tie it all up together now. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. So a lot of the times, guys, when you're trying to find an answer, I really recommend try to find an answer in the same book of the Bible. It's good to compare Scripture with Scripture. It's good to compare different books with different books. But the best one to, uh, to compare to is the same book. Many times, the same book has the answer. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, 
when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So pay attention now. They're espoused together. What is a spouse? It's a husband or a wife. These, they, they, they're married. Okay, These two are married. Okay, But she's found to be with child, right? She's found to be with child. And it says here that, uh, uh, verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. What does this mean? He's a righteous man. He's doing the right thing. Okay, He's found just. And look at this. And not willing to make her a public example, so he doesn't want to embarrass her publicly, was minded to put her away privily. Okay? So he wants to divorce her. Put away is another way of saying divorce. And the Bible says what he's doing is just. All right? Let's keep reading. Oh, I'll just leave it there. Okay? What he was doing was just. So think about this. They had not yet come together. They had not yet consummated the marriage as husband and wife. And before they had come together, she was found to be with child. And the Bible says he was just to think that he should put her away privately. Okay? So he was just the Bible says he was doing right to think I should divorce this woman. Okay, So what is the grounds of divorce then? The Bible said fornication, didn't it? It said fornication. What do we see in the same book here, giving us an example of the same event, or the same situation, is that if you uh, get married and you find out that your wife has not been faithful, okay, and has hid that from you, you find out, you know, before you consummate the marriage with that woman, then you can biblically divorce her. You can biblically give her a bill of divorcement and she will be free to marry another man. Okay, That's the, the condition, that's the framework of what the Bible speaks when it comes to divorce. And you say, well, that's, that doesn't ever happen. Well, that's because we're used to our culture. right? We're used to marriage and on the same day of marriage, you know, normally husband and wife go somewhere, they consummate the marriage immediately and it's done. Okay, but in many cultures around the world, you know, in Chile, South America, in other places like Europe, many times they're married, they're legally married, okay, but then several weeks or several months might pass before they actually consummate the marriage. Why? Because they're first legally married, then they might decide to get married, you know, with a formal reception, a formal wedding, formal party at a, at a church or something. That might take longer to prepare. And like in South America, Chile, you, you cannot get married in a church unless you first show the pastor that you have been married legally. Okay, And obviously, there would be a time that took place there. This is the same thing that is happening in these days in Israel. They would be legally married, but it might take a, little, several, several t uh, um, a time before they consummate that marriage. Okay? And during that time, if she's found to be unfaithful, uh, you know, pregnant with a child like Joseph found out, then he could divorce, divorce her okay, at that point. But they're already legally married. All right? If you have any questions about that for me later on, Please ask. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 19. I'm not done. I'm not done. Back to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Verse 9. Let's look at it again. And my final reason. So I've given you a few reasons now why or, or, or where the, um, the, 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 um, the, the boundaries of the framework work of fornication fits in. But finally, I'm a King James Bible believer. Okay. I believe this book has been perfectly translated. I believe every word is pure, and I believe every word in this Bible is there for a reason. Okay? Now look at this. Let's look at verse number 9 again. Because if we want to say that fornication is also just another way of saying adultery or something like that, then why in verse number 9 do our translators, or why does God allow the English to be worded this way? And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except be for fornication. Okay? and shall marry another commit of adultery. They've got the word adultery already in this verse. All right? And then it says, And whoso marry her which put away doth commit adultery. Twice in this verse, we have the words adultery. There's got to be a reason in verse number 9 why they use the word fornication. And I'll tell you why. It's to differentiate fornication from adultery as a separate act. Okay? So those are my reasons why... Um, I believe fornication for divorce is prior to a husband and wife consummating the marriage. All right, let's move on from there. Verse number 10. If you have any questions, please ask me after the service. Verse number 10. His disciples say unto him, 
if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Say, what? <laughs> They're saying, look, if this is the case, if we can't divorce our wives for every reason, it's just better not to get married. And they say, well, that sounds ridiculous. But again, look at our nation. No fault divorce. You get divorced for any reason. Does it surprise us then that people today don't want to get married? Does it surprise us today that people would rather just live with de facto relationships? Just, just try it out, see how it goes. And if it works out, maybe then get married. Look, people don't respect marriage today like they should. Okay? And, and the, 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 the statement that is being said here is essentially what's happened to our nations. Who cares? Why get married? Why one woman? You know, why can't I just enjoy my life and have several and whatever? You know, what's the point? Why do I need to settle down? That's what happens when you destroy what marriage is about. When you don't preach about it till death do us part, it starts destroying the fabric of the family in our nation. Now think about this. Think about this. You say, well, this hurts my feelings a little bit, you know. Think about this. Think of your children, right? If your children grow up thinking, well, I can get divorced for any reason, okay? Marriage is not important. If it doesn't work out, I can just get divorced, okay? If, if that's how they grow up, do you think they're going to, when they, when they choose their married par marriage partner, do you think they're going to take con serious consideration for that? Do you think they're going to really care about who they're marrying when they feel, well, I can get divorced for any reason if it doesn't work out? Of course, they're not going to take it seriously. But if your children grow up in a church that preaches the word of God, that preaches this is death, uh, till, you know, till death do us part, don't you think when your child gets to a married age, they're going to really think long and hard about my marriage partner. Hey, uh, the person I'm going to marry, that's going to be the person I'm with for the rest of my life. And, and don't you think when, when you're married and you start having relationship problems, and we all do, Every married couple here can testify that we've had problems in our marriages. But don't you think that when you, when you understand this is till death to us part, you're going to say, well, I need to work out these problems. We need to sort this out because we need to live together. We want to be in harmony. We want to enjoy our lives. We're going to sort out our problems. Of course, they're going to fix that when, they, when their mindset is till death to us part. But if their mind is, well, we can just get divorced for any reason or for no reason, of course, when, when the problems come, well, what's the point of sorting it out? Let's just get divorced and try again with someone else. Okay, so this is important preaching because we want our children to grow up and make serious decisions about who they marry. Okay, let's keep reading verse number 12, verse number 12. Oh, sorry, verse 11. But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. So they're saying like it's better for not, for, to not get married. And Jesus says, look, um, all men cannot receive this saying. In other words, most men do want to get married. Most men want a wife. Most men want that companionship, that, that help uh, meet for them, okay? But then he says, save they to whom it is given. So there is some people, some men in the Bible, that have the gift of not being married, okay? They have no desire to be married. They have no desire to be with a wife, all right? Now, if you say to me, you know, oh, yeah, I don't want to get married. Maybe I'm one of these guys, you know, that have the gift. Well, you know, if you burn for, for a woman, if you have a desire for a woman, that's not you. Okay? These men don't have that desire. We'll have a look soon. Look at verse number 12. Verse number 12. This is who Jesus is speaking about. For there are some eunuchs, okay, now let's look at this, which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have been ma who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So this is a saying just for some to receive, okay? To those that can receive it, uh, let him receive this saying, okay? So Jesus is speaking about eunuchs. These are men that are not married. These are men that do not desire to be with a woman, all right? So let's look at it. There's three eunuchs being described here. The first eunuch, it says here, it says, which were born, were so born from their mother's womb, okay? So there are some men that are born disabled. There are some men that are born with deformities, okay? And they cannot, you know, uh, have that marital relationship, okay? That's what Jesus Christ is speaking about here, okay? Some people that cannot have that marriage relationship because they've been born like that from their mother's womb. They have some type of deformity, some problem with them that they cannot even have that physical relationship, okay? Then he says, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. 
Now, this is pretty disgusting, but, you know, in, in the olden times, you know, I don't know if it happens, I hope it doesn't happen today, but in some of the olden times, right, when, when people would conquer other, other people, when people would conquer other nations, sometimes they'll take the men of those other nations and castrate them, all right? The same way you would castrate a bull so you can have like an ox, you know, like a, like a calmer ox, okay? Because when you castrate a man, a man, you know, the, the, the hormones change, the testosterone doesn't, you know, develop in their bodies the way it normally would. And so you would have a more docile man, okay? So this is, a, they, they castrate a man so they can, serve, they can be a servant, okay? And not sort of be in a position to want to fight back because they don't have those t t testosterone hormones, you know, surging through their bodies. That's pretty disgusting, okay? But that's what Jesus says. There are some like that, okay? It's, it's happening in history. Jesus is not saying that's something you should do. He's just making a point, Okay, there's a point, some people are born disabled, some people are castrated from, for men, okay, in that sense. But then he says this, and this is the one that he's really referring to here. And he says, and there be some eunuchs, or there be eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So there are some men who have the ability to with, withhold themselves from a woman. And the reason they can do that is because their desire is for the kingdom of God. Their desire is to serve God with all that they have for their whole lives. And we have an example of this person with the Apostle Paul. And you guys know the Apostle Paul wrote many epistles of the New Testament. He was used greatly by God. He was never married. He didn't have any kids. Okay, And he served as an apostle. You know, He gave himself completely for the starting of churches. He gave himself completely for preaching the gospel. He didn't have a wife and kids to take care of. There was nothing holding back the Apostle Paul. He was fully uh, you know, serving in the kingdom of God. So there are some people, yes, very few men, that are this way, that have such a desire for the kingdom that they'd rather not get married and use all that they have to serve the Lord. All right? Now, we know the qualifications of a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. Okay? And this is why the Apostle Paul was never a pastor. He never pastored a church. He served an apostle. He was there serving as a missionary, but he was never a pastor because he was never the husband of one wife. Okay? Let's keep reading. Verse number 13. Then uh, were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them. Now, before I keep reading the rest of it, remember last week, chapter 18, and the disciples were asking, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What did God do? What, sorry, what did Jesus do? He took a little child, didn't he, right? And brought him in the midst of them, all right? And he talks about how important the little children are. And it boggles my mind because the disciples did not learn. Look what, look what happens here. And they were brought unto him, little children, that he should put his hands on them, like to bless them, to pray for them. And, and, and it says here, and the disciples rebuked them. Okay? But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid hands on them and departed thence. So you see Jesus Christ, they're rebuking his disciples. They did not learn from the previous chapter. Jesus Christ speaking highly of little children. You know, having to humble yourself as a little child. We saw that last week. And here they are making the mistakes again. You know, not respecting, not receiving the little children. And just again, guys, we need to remind ourselves, little children are important. Little children need to hear the word of God. Little children, look, we've made mistakes in our lives, but we want our children to not make the same mistakes that we've made, and we need to show them what the Word of God says. We need to really spend time with the children. They're the next generation. Okay? They're the next generation of Christians, and they're going to grow up in a generation that's going to be harder for them to serve the Lord than it is for us. Okay? Generation after generation, it's getting harder and harder to serve the Lord. The world is getting more wicked. There's more persecution against preaching from the Word of God, okay? We need to be praying for our children. We need to be receiving the little children the same way that Jesus Christ did. Verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So we, this is a story of the young rich ruler now, okay? We're now changing gears to a new story. This young rich ruler goes to Jesus and this man wants to be saved. This man wants to receive eternal life. He's gone to the right person. He's gone to Jesus, asking him the question. Hey, and there's a lot of churches, there are a lot of people that claim the name of Jesus today. They want to be saved. They want to go to heaven. And they know I've got to go to Jesus. But they make the same mistake the young rich ruler says. What well, he says, what good thing shall I do 
This young rich ruler wants to receive eternal life because he wants to do good works. You know, he wants to earn his way to heaven. And we know in this church that you'll never earn your way to heaven. You, we know that there's no amount of good works you can do to ever be uh, accepted by God. All right? This man had the right person, Jesus, but he wanted to do it by his works. Okay? How many churches are there today that claim Jesus Christ, that speak highly of Jesus, and they're still preaching a gospel of works? They're no different to the young rich ruler. All right? Verse number 17. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But... If thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. All right, now let's think about this. Jesus Christ says, why do you call me good? Now, was Jesus good? I think everyone, I mean, even non-believers generally think Jesus was a good man, a good teacher at least, right? Of course, Jesus was good. So what is Jesus saying? That is God. He says, why do you call me good? There's only one good, that is God. Therefore, I am God, is what Jesus is God. I'm pointing to myself. I'm not God. But Jesus, obviously, saying, I am God, right? Jesus is he's doing that, okay? And then he says, well, you know, basically, if you want to do good works, then this is how you get to heaven. You keep the commandments, right? Jesus is given the answer that the young rich man is looking for. You know, I need to do works. All right, yeah, keep the commandments. All right, let's have a look. What are the commandments here? Verse number 18. He saith unto him, which... Jesus said, well, thou shalt not do murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So Jesus quotes some of the Ten Commandments there. And then verse 20, the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Do you believe this? Do you believe this, this young man, I don't know how it is, let's say he was... 18 or whatever. He's a young ritual. Okay? Let's say he's 18. He says, look, I've kept all these commandments from my youth up. What is he saying? I've, not, I've never disobeyed the commandments. I'm sinless is what he's saying. He's saying, I've never broken the commands of God. Is he telling the truth? No, nobody can do this. I mean, I've got 10 kids. I'm telling you, by the age of two, they've committed thousands of sins already. All right? That's what they call them, the terrible twos for a reason. All right? Because they've committed a, a, a great amount of sins by the time they get to that age. All right? Verse 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, okay, if you're going to be perfect, go and sell that, 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 uh, that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. All right. Now we need to think about this for a minute, okay? Because people get confused. This is where people get the idea of works gospel based gospels. Okay, Jesus says, I've got to sell my things, I've got to keep the commandments, and then I can have eternal life. That's what Jesus Christ is teaching here. But just think about this. If someone, if someone says to you, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? What are you going to say to that person? Of course, you're going to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I mean, do you, is anyone here truly going to say, someone comes up to you, what must I do to be saved? Are you truly going to say, go and sell that thou hast? Just go and sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow Jesus. Is that what you're going to say to someone to be saved? Is Jesus telling this person, if you do this, you'll be saved? No, what Jesus Christ is doing is showing him that he does not have God as his priority. That this young rich ruler still has his riches above God. Now these, these riches, these, these possessions, his material wealth was his God and not the Lord Jesus Christ. He would rather keep his money Okay, then follow after Christ. What Jesus is trying to show this man is you are a sinner. Okay, you cannot put aside your money after God. If you can't do that, hey, that's your sin. He's trying to show this man that he's a sinner. And that's why when we start, when we go and preach the gospel door to door, the first thing we're trying to do is to show this person you're a sinner. You know, have, you, have you ever told a lie? Yeah, well, you're a sinner. You've broken the laws of God. You've broken that shall not uh, bear false witness as one of the commandments. You're already a sinner. You know, and then we can go from there. Jesus Christ is showing this man, you're not sinless. You haven't kept all the commandments. You are a sinner. Verse number 22. Verse number 22. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, what he should have said was, Jesus, I can't give up my possessions. I, I love my riches too much. Is there another way to be saved? That's what he should have said. And no doubt Jesus would have said to him, yeah, believe in me. Okay, believe on me. Okay, but let's keep reading. Verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man can hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
And this is so true. This is so true. On the Sunshine Coast where I am, uh, where, we, where we've got our church base, there's a lot of rich people in that area. There's a lot of people with money, a lot of people that have retired. They don't have to worry about working. They're relaxing. They've, they've got it easy now. So unreceptive. And if you've, been, if you've gone door knocking in places that are rich where people have a bit more money, you know how unreceptive those people's, people are. This is a true saying of Jesus Christ, that for rich men, it's very hard for them to answer the kingdom of heaven. Like for rich people, they really have to come to a point of loss. You know, a point of, of, of like, where do I go to now? Like my, my life is, is vain. My life is empty. This money is empty. What, what is that for me? That's really what a rich man has to get to. You know, a point of despair in order for them then to call out to Christ and, and, and know the way of salvation. But uh, uh, look at verse 24. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, th this verse is very simple. We, we know what a needle is. People use needles to sew. And so the, the eye of a needle is a very small hole. We know what a camel is. It's a large animal. And of course, we would say a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. Okay, well, that's what we would say, right? Common sense. Just reading the Bible. Of course, a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. But I just want to show you what's how some people interpret this. Okay, just very quickly, it won't take us too long. Some people teach, you know, if you know Jerusalem, um, you know, the, 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 the ancient cities back then had, had uh, like huge walls, you know, to protect them from the enemy. And then at night they would close the gates. So the enemy cannot come through, the, you know, at, at night. So the story goes that if you were traveling with a camel and you wanted to get into Jerusalem at night, they would not open the gates just in case you were an enemy, you know, and then armies would come into the city. But they would open this little passageway, you know, and this is called the Eye of the Needle, okay? This is the, this, these are the Jewish fables, okay? <laughs> so there's a small little passageway called the Eye of the Needle, and the only way a camel could go through that into the city was for the camel to go onto all its knees, for it to be completely unburdened, and for it to enter in like that. So it's very difficult to get a camel through the Eye of the Needle gate, Okay, now that, say, well, that sounds interesting. Maybe that's true. Yeah, but it messes this up. <laughs> okay, it messes it up completely. Because you see, just like a camel cannot go through a needle, the eye of a needle, salvation is impossible for man. You cannot be saved by your own efforts. You cannot be saved by keeping the commandments. It's impossible for you. But if it's speaking about a camel going through a small gate, it's very hard but it's achievable. So think about the gospel there. Okay, well, that gospel would be, well, getting saved requires a lot of hard work, you know, requires a lot of effort, but man can save themselves. So you can see how that interpretation just messes up the gospel. The gospel is you cannot save yourself. That's why you need the Savior. Okay, that's the gospel. And this is exactly what Jesus Christ says in verse 25. Verse 25, he says, When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? The, the disciples know that it's impossible for man to... Look, a, a camel cannot go through the eye. If a camel could go through a small gate, they wouldn't say uh, this. They wouldn't ask the question, um, you know, that who then can be saved? But look at verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. The reason you can be saved today, the reason you can be forgiven for your sins is because God made it possible. Okay? It was impossible for you. you no matter how, how much hard works you put into it, you're not going to make it. Okay? You're not going to make it. Okay? Jesus did all the hard work. Jesus paid the penalty. Jesus paid for your sins. And God makes it easy. Okay? God makes it easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept what He's done for you. Salvation is easy for us. Jesus did all the hard work. Verse 27. Then answered Peter. So we're near the end now. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? So what Peter's saying here is, well, if it's, only, if it's possible by God, it's not possible by man. But we've left a lot for you, Jesus. We know that Peter and the others, they left their full-time jobs as, you know, as fishermen, Levi as a tax collector. They left these jobs to follow after Christ. Remember that? So they, they left a lot of things for Christ, okay? And he's asking this question, well, then what profit, like what's the advantage of us doing all this stuff? 
you know. And this is where Jesus now turns toward our rewards in heaven. You see, just because salvation is free, just because it's a free gift, doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to work hard. Doesn't mean that he doesn't want you to serve him. Of course he wants you to serve him. Of course he wants you to do good works. Of course he wants you to keep the commandments. Not for salvation, because that's impossible, but in order to fellowship, to be a disciple, to serve the Lord, you ought to strive, now that you are saved, to serve him. And this is how Jesus responds to Peter. He says there in verse number, uh, verse number 28, verse number 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So you see, Jesus now is pointing them to heavenly rewards, okay, eternal rewards. He says to these, these twelve disciples, those that have left everything to follow after him, he says, look, you've got an advantage. You're going to be rewarded. You're going to, in the millennium, this is what I believe he's talking about, the regeneration, when we have our new resurrected bodies we, and, and the Lord rules and reigns on this earth, that these 12 apostles, well, of course not, not Judas, you know, some people say it's Matthias or, or, or Paul, but anyway, that they will rule and reign with Jesus Christ during those thousand years and each one of them will be ruling over a tribe of Israel. Okay? So they're going to get reward. They're going to, be, they're going to have high positions of authority because they left a lot, they, forsake, they forsook a lot of things for the Lord. And verse 29, and everyone that have forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. You see, whatever you give up for the Lord, okay, maybe before this church existed, maybe on Tuesday nights you already had other plans. You know, maybe you already had plans for, you know, catching up with your friends, maybe plans to go and play soccer or something or some sporting thing, or right? And you said, no, you know what? On Tuesday nights, I'm going to be in church. I'm going to forsake that what I had. Jesus says, I'm going to reward you for that if you forsook it for my name. Whatever you lose in this life for Christ, Jesus says you're going to receive an hundredfold. Okay, and, and let me just encourage a lot of you guys, because maybe a lot of you have not grown up in a Christian home. You know, you believe the gospel. What happens to a lot of people? Their family disown them, or they just don't. don't they, you know, they hate them. They don't want anything to do with them. And they feel they feel like you've you've lost your mind, and you might lose those relationships. Jesus says you're going to be rewarded in heaven. You're going to be rewarded in the future. Okay, whatever you leave. And this, for me personally, this was an encouragement to me when I went to the Sunshine Coast to start the church in Queensland. You know, I was I was leaving my my parents. I was leaving. My friends, I was leaving the, you know, Sydney where I grew up in, you know, my whole life. I was losing all these things where I'm comfortable. I was going to a place where I really did not know many people. You know, the people that I did know, I didn't really know them that well. And I was encouraged by this verse in the world, if I'm losing these things for the name of Christ, then I'm going to receive a hundredfold in the future. Now, sometimes these sacrifices are important. Jesus says a hundredfold, a hundred times. You know, you know if, you ever, if you have a job and you work overtime, sometimes your employer will pay you double time. You know, for doing what well, Jesus says, he's going to pay you a hundred times. Okay, a hundred times for the things that you've left in order to serve him. And then in verse number 30, verse number 30. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So this parallels the teaching from the last chapter. Remember, again, the little child. Jesus putting the little child in the midst and saying, look, you need to be humble like this little child. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to get the most rewards? Who's going to have the highest positions of authority in the kingdom to come? Those that made themselves last, okay? Not those that promote themselves, not those that, that seek the, the praise of men. Look how much I'm serving the Lord. Look how much I'm doing. No, not those people, okay? The ones that do the most for the Lord are those that just get into the work, that just shut up. I'm just going to serve the Lord. Who cares if I get the praise of men? They're the ones, the ones that come last to serve other people. Those that humble themselves and lift up their fellow men. They're the ones that are going to come first into the, in the kingdom, all right? So let's leave it there and pray.